Chapter eighty five of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter eighty five. Further reflections. I might, without blame, have envied them those sweet throbbings of the heart, so different from my own, widely different, since mine beat with the most painful pulsations. The cloud which had fallen upon it through the revelations of the Mexican had been further darkened by the details that confirmed them, and now that the excitement of the conflict was over, and i had an opportunity to reflect upon the future with comparative coolness the agony of my soul became more concentrated and keen i scarcely felt joy that my life was saved i almost wished that i had perished by the hands of the indians the strange story of the trapper now fully corroborated by its own heroine with the additional facts obtained from herself, were only partially the cause of the horrid fancies that now shaped themselves in my imagination. I could have but one belief about the intentions of Stebbins. That was that the base wretch was playing procurator to his despot master, doubtless to serve some ends of self-advancement since i well knew that such were the titles of promotion in the mormon hierarchy with the experience of her sister fresh before my eyes i could have no other belief than that lillian too was being led to a like sacrifice and how was this sacrifice to be stayed how was the sad catastrophe to be averted it was in the endeavour to answer these interrogatories that i felt my feebleness the utter absence of strength had it been a mere question of overtaking the caravan there would have been no need for the slightest uneasiness it would still be many days weeks indeed before the north-going train could arrive at its destination and if my apprehensions about the designs of stebbins were well founded lillian would be in no danger until after her arrival in the so-called mormon city it was there within the walls of that modern gomorrah upon a shrine consecrated to the mockery of every moral sentiment that the sacrifice of virtue was to be offered up there was it that the wolf awaited the lamb for his victim bride i knew if no obstacle should be encountered such as that which had just delayed us that we could easily come up with the mormon immigrant we had no longer a similar obstacle to dread the whole country beyond the mountains was utah territory and we could count upon these indians as friends from that quarter we had nothing to apprehend and the caravan might easily be overtaken but what then even though in company with it for my purpose i should be as powerless as ever by what right should i interfere with either the squatter or his child no doubt it was their determination to proceed with the mormons and to mormon city at least the father's determination this was no longer a matter of doubt and what could i urge to prevent his carrying it out i had no argument not the color of a claim for interference in any way 
nay it was more than probable that to the migrating mormons i should be a most unwelcome apparition to stebbins i certainly should and perhaps to holt himself i might expect no very courteous treatment at their hands with stebbins for their leader and that fact was now ascertained i might find myself in danger from his denites of whom no doubt there would be a party policing the train such considerations were not to be disregarded i knew the hostility which even under ordinary circumstances these fanatics are accustomed to feel toward outsiders to their faith but i had also heard of their display of it when in possession of the power the sectary who sets foot in the city of latter-day saints or travels with a mormon train will be prudent to keep his descent to himself woe to him if he proclaim it too boastingly not only with the difficulties then but with dangers was my purpose beset though the difficulties caused me far more concern than the actual dangers had holt been upon my side had i been certain of his consent i should have cared little for the danger of an abduction for this was the plan to which my thoughts now pointed even had i been sure that lillian herself would agree to such a thing i should have deemed all danger light and still have entertained a hope of its accomplishment the contingencies appeared fearfully unfavorable the father would not consent the daughter might not it was this last doubt that gave the darkest hue to my reflections i continued them turning the subject over and over viewing it from every point surely holt would not contribute to the ruin of his daughter for in no other light did i regard her introduction to the society of the mormon city there was manhood in the man somewhere down near the bottom of his heart perhaps some remnants of rough virtue this i had myself proved and if filial testimony were to be trusted he was not so abandoned of a character as he appeared was it possible he could be aware of the real intentions of the churl who was leading him and his to ruin after all he might not it is true he was aware that stebbins was a mormon but as marian has suggested in her efforts to justify him poor girl he might be ignorant of the true character of these sanctified forebands the story that marian had died on her way out showed that holt was being grossly deceived in relation to that matter it also gave color to the idea that he might be equally the victim of deception about the other it was in the hope of being able to hold him guiltless i had so closely questioned marian for instinct had already whispered me that in his hands more than in aught else rested my hope or my ruin for that reason had i been so eager to ascertain his inclinings that he was under some obligation to the pseudo apostle was perfectly clear more than a mere obligation something that produced a condition of awe as i had myself been a witness some dark secret no doubt was shared between them but were it ever so dark even were it black murder it might not be on the part of holt a voluntary endurance 
and Marian had hinted at something of this sort. Here, out in the midst of the wild desert, far from justice and from judges, punishment for an old offense might be less dreaded, and a man of the bold stamp of this Tennessean squatter might hopefully dream of escaping from the ties of terror by which his spirit had so long been enthralled conjectures of this nature were chasing one another through my brain and not without the effect of once more giving a brighter tinge to the color of my mental horizon i naturally turned my eyes upon marian in her i beheld an ally of no ordinary kind one whose motive for aiding me to rescue her sister could be scarce less powerful than my own poor girl she was still in the enjoyment of those moments of bliss she knew not the misery that was yet in store for her wingrove had my directions to be silent upon that theme the more easily obeyed in the fullness of his own happiness it was no pleasant task to dash from their lips the cup of sweet joy but the time was pressing and as the sacrifice must come it might as well come at once i saw that the utahs had given up the pursuit most of them had returned to the scene of their short conflict while others singly or in squads were moving toward the butte the women too were approaching some with the wounded some carrying the bodies of the slain warriors chaunting the dismal death song as they marched solemnly along casting a glance at the wailing multitude i leaped down from the rock and rapidly descended to the plain End of chapter 85 Chapter 86 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California the Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed Chapter 86 A True Tigress I walked out toward the stream. The lovers met me halfway. As I looked in their eyes, illumined and sparkling with the pure light of love, I hesitated in my intent. After all, thought I, there will not be time to tell her the whole story. The Indians will soon be on the ground. Our presence will be required in the council, and perhaps it will be better to postpone the revelation till that is over. Let her enjoy her new-found happiness for an hour longer. I was thus hesitating, at the same time looking the beautiful huntress in the face when all of a sudden i saw her start and fling from her the hand she had been hitherto holding in her fond clasp the look of her lover mine as well was that of bewildered astonishment not so hers her cheek turned pale then red then paled again while a glance of proud anger shot forth from her eyes the glance was directed outward toward the plain back upon wingrove and then once more quick and piercing toward the plain equally puzzled by her look and behavior i faced round in the direction indicated by her glance i had the explanation at once the chief wakara had arrived at the butte and sat halted upon his war steed 
by the side of the wagon there were three or four other indians around him mounted and afoot but one on horseback was entirely unlike the rest this one was a woman she was not bound yet it was easy to see she was a captive that could be told by the way she was encircled by the indians as well as by their treatment of her she was on horseback as already stated and near to the utah chief in front of him neither wingrove nor i had any difficulty in identifying the captive it was su wan ni the chickasaw the eye of jealousy had found her equally easy of identification since it was by it she was first recognized and it was upon her that marian was directing those lightning glances it was her presence that had caused that convulsive start and those fearful emotions that now proclaimed themselves in the countenance of the huntress maiden the storm soon burst perjured hypocrite this is the love you have sworn with the oath still burning upon your lips once more betrayed o oh, man once more betrayed o oh, god would that i had left you to your fate i declare marian declare nothing more to me enough yonder is your attraction yonder oh to think of this outrage here even here to the wild desert has he brought her she who has been the cause of all my unhappy ha huh, she is coming up to you now sir meet her face to face help her from her horse wait upon her go villain go i swear marion by the livin his speech was interrupted at that moment su wani who had shot her horse clear from the entourage of her guards came galloping upon the ground i was myself so surprised at this proceeding that i could not stir from the spot and not until the chickasaw had passed directly in front of us and halted there could i believe that i was otherwise than dreaming wingrove appeared equally the victim of a bewildered surprise as su drew up she gave utterance to a shrill scream and flinging herself from her horse rushed onward in the direction of marion the latter had turned away at the conclusion of her frantic speech and was now close to the bank of the stream with her back towards us there was no mistaking the intention of the chickasaw the hideous expression of her face the lurid fire burning in her oblique eyes the white teeth shining and wolf-like all betrayed her horrid design which was further made manifest by a long knife seen glittering in her grasp with all my voice i raised a warning shout wingrove did the same so too the utahs who were following their captive the shout was heard and heeded fortunately it was so else in another instant warning would have been too late and the vengeful chickasaw would have launched herself upon her unconscious victim the huntress faced round on hearing the cry she saw the approaching danger and with the subtle quickness of that indian nature common to both she placed herself in an attitude of defence she had no weapon her late love scene needed none her rifle had been left by the butte and she was without arm of any kind but quick as thought she wound the, the mexican serape about her wrist and held it to shield her body from the threatened thrust 
the chickasaw paused as if to make more certain of her aim and for a moment the two stood face to face glaring at each other with that look of concentrated hate which jealousy alone can give it was the enraged tigress about to spring upon the beautiful panther that had crossed her path all this action was well-nigh instantaneous so quick in its occurrence that neither i nor wingrove could get up in time to hinder the assailant we both hastened forward as fast as it was in our power but we should have been too late had the thrust been better aimed or less skilfully avoided it was given with a wild scream the chickasaw bounded forward and dealt the stroke but by a dexterous slight the huntress received it on the serape and the blade glanced harmlessly aside we hurried onward to get between them but at that moment a third combatant became mingled in the fray and the safety of marion was secured it was not the hand of man that had rescued her but an ally whom perhaps she deemed more faithful it was the dog wolf the impetus which the indian had given to the thrust and its consequent failure had carried her past her intended victim she was turning with the design of renewing the attack when the dog rushed upon the ground with a savage growl the animal sprang forward and vaulting high into the air launched himself on the breast of the chickasaw at the same instant seizing her by the throat in this position he clung holding on by his terrible teeth and aided by his paws with which he kept constantly clawing the bosom of the indian it was a painful spectacle and now that marion was safe wingrove and i ran on with the intention of releasing the woman from the grasp of the dog before we could get near both victim and avenger disappeared from our sight the indian in her wild terror had been retreating backward in this way she had reached the bank and having lost her footing had fallen back downward upon the water as we arrived upon the edge neither woman nor dog was visible both had sunk to the bottom almost on the instant they reappeared on the surface the dog uppermost and we saw that his teeth were still fastened upon the throat of his human victim half a dozen men leaped into the water and after a struggle the savage animal was dragged from his hold it was too late the sharp incisors had done their dread work and as the body of the wretched woman was raised over the bank those who lifted it perceived that the last breath had gone out of it the limbs were supple and the pulse no longer beat suwanee had ceased to live End of chapter eighty six chapter eighty seven of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter 87. Suspicious Appearances. The Indians came crowding around the corpse, both warriors and women. Their exclamations betokened no sympathy even the squaws looked on with unpitying aspect though the victim was of their own race and sex 
they knew she had been allied with their enemies and had been witnesses of her savage assault upon Marani, though ignorant of its motive some of them who had lost kindred in the strife already stirred by grief and fury were proceeding to insult the lifeless and mutilated remains to mutilate them still more i turned away from the loathsome scene neither the dead nor the living that composed this ghastly tableau had further interest for me my glance wandering in search of other forms first fell upon that of wingrove he was standing near in an attitude that betokened extreme prostration of spirit his head hung forward over his breast but his eyes were not directed to the ground they were turned upward gazing after a form that was passing away it was that of the huntress the girl had regained her horse and was riding off followed by the dog she went slowly as if irresolute both as to the act and the direction in both the horse appeared to have his will the reins rested loosely upon his withers while his rider seemed wrapped in a silent abstraction i was hastening towards my arab with the design of joining her when i saw that i was anticipated another had conceived a similar intention it was wakara the young chief still on horseback was seen spurring out from the midst of his men and guiding his war steed in the direction taken by the huntress before i could lay hands upon my bridle he had galloped up to marion and falling into a gentler pace rode on by her side i did not attempt to follow them somewhat chagrined at having my designs interrupted i gave up the intention of mounting my horse and turned back towards wingrove as soon as i was near enough to read the expression upon his features i saw that my chagrin was more than shared by him an emotion of most rancorous bitterness was burning in the breast of the young backwoodsman his glance was fixed upon the two forms slowly receding across the plain he was regarding every movement of both with that concentrated gaze which jealousy alone can give nonsense wingrove said i reading the thoughts of his heart don't let that trouble you there's nothing between them i can assure you certainly the spectacle was enough to excite the suspicions of a less jealous lover if not to justify them both the equestrians had halted at a distant part of the plain they were not so distant but that their attitudes could be observed they still remained on horseback but the horses were side by side and so near each other that the bodies of their riders appeared almost touching the head of the chief was bent forward and downward while his hand appeared extended outward as if holding that of the huntress it was a fearful tableau for a lover to contemplate even at a distance and the white lips clenched teeth and quick irregular beating of wingrove's heart perfectly audible to me as i stood beside him told what terrible emotions the sight was inspiring him i was myself puzzled at the attitude of the utah chief as well as the silent complacence with which his attentions appeared to be received it certainly had the seeming of gallantry though i was loath to believe in its reality in truth i could not give credence to such a thought it was not human nature not even woman's to play false in such sans facon the appearance must certainly be a deception i was endeavouring to conjecture an explanation when a moving object attracted my attention it was a horseman who appeared upon the plain beyond where the huntress and the chief had halted to our eyes he was nearly in a line with them approaching down the valley from the upper canyon 
out of which he had evidently issued he was still at a considerable distance from the other two but it could be seen that he was coming on at full gallop and straight towards them in a few moments he would be up to where they stood i watched this horseman with interest i was in hopes he would keep on his course and interrupt the scene that was annoying myself and torturing my companion i was not disappointed in the hope the hurrying horseman rode straight on and having arrived within a few paces of the ground occupied by the others drew his horse to a halt at the same instant the utah chief was seen to separate from his companion and riding up to the stranger appeared to enter into conversation with him after some minutes had elapsed the chief faced round to the huntress and apparently giving utterance to some parting speech headed his horse toward the butte and along with the stranger came galloping downward the huntress kept her place but i saw her dismount and stoop down towards the dog as if caressing him i resolved to seize the opportunity of speaking with her alone and bidding wingrove wait for my return i once more hastened to lay hold of my horse perhaps i should encounter the chief on the way perhaps he might not exactly like the proceeding but marion must be communicated with upon something besides matters of love and my honest intention rendered me less timid about my idle construction the savage might please to put upon my conduct thus fortified i leaped to the back of my steed and hurried off upon my errand end of chapter eighty seven recording by john brandon chapter eighty eight of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a fresh eclair assessment as we rode in counter directions i met the chief almost on the instant i was slightly surprised that he passed without taking notice of me he could not fail to guess whither i was going as i was headed straight for the huntress and here was no other object to have drawn me in that direction he did not even appear to see me as he passed at a rapid pace his eyes were bent forward upon the butt or occasionally turned towards the horseman who galloped by his side the strange horseman was an indian from the absence of the war costume i could tell he had not been engaged in the late conflict but had just arrived from some distant journey no doubt a messenger who brought news his jaded horse and dusky garb justified this conjecture equally desirous of shunning an encounter i passed the two riders in silence and kept on my course as i drew near to the huntress maiden i was speculating on the reception i might expect and the explanation i ought to give how would she receive me not with much grace i feared at all events not till she should hear what i had to say the ambiguous and ill-timed appearance of the chickasaw combined with the sinister and dramatic incident which followed must have produced on her mind eccentric and erroneous impressions the effect would naturally be to falsify not only the protestations of her lover but my own testimony borne in his behalf and indeed all else she had been told it was not difficult to predict an ungracious reception as i approached she gave over caressing the dog and once more leaped to the back of her horse i was in fear that she would ride off and shun me i knew i could easily overtake her but a chase of this nature would scarcely have been to my liking marion halt i said in a tone of gentle remonstrance your suspicions are unjust i have come to offer you an explanation i need none interrupted she in a quiet voice but without raising her eyes a gentle wave of her hand accompanied the words i fancied both the tone and the gesture were repellent but soon perceived that i was mistaken 
I need none, she repeated. All has been explained. Explained how? I inquired, taken by surprise at the unexpected declaration. Wakara has told me all. What? Of Suwani? A gesture of assent was the answer. I'm glad of this, but Wakara, how knew he the circumstance? Partly from the Mexican to whom your people have communicated them, partly from the captive Arifahos. Enough, I'm satisfied. And you forgive Wingrove? Forgiveness now lies upon his side. I have not only wronged him by my suspicions, but I have revealed him. I deserve his contempt. I can scarcely hope to be forgiven. Light had broken upon me. Bright light it was for Wingrove. The suspicious duet with the Utah chief was explained. Its innocence was made further manifest by what came under my eyes at the moment. On the arm that was raised in gesture, I observed a strip of cotton wound round it above the wrist. A spot of blood appeared through the rag. Ah, you are wounded, said I, noticing the bandage. It is nothing, merely a scratch made by the point of the knife. Wakara has bound it up. It still bleeds a little, but it is nothing. It was the role of the surgeon, then, the chief had been playing when seen in that ambiguous attitude. More light for Wingrove. What a find, I said, my reflection directed towards Suwani. She deserved death. Ah, the unfortunate woman. Hers has been a terrible fate, and whether she deserved it or not, I cannot help feeling pity for her. I would go to God it had been otherwise. But this faithful companion saw the attempt upon my life, and when anyone attacks me, Nothing can restrain him. It is not the first time he has protected me from an enemy. Ah, uh, me. Mine has been a life of sad incidents, at least the last six months of it. I essayed to rescue her from these gloomy reflections. I foresaw the termination of her troubles. Their end was near. Words of cheer were easily spoken. I could promise her the forgiveness of her lover, since I knew how freely and promptly that would be obtained. Ah, Marion, I said, a bright future is before you. With that I could say as much for myself, for your sister Lillian. Ha! exclaimed she, suddenly excited to an extreme point of interest. Tell me of my sister. You promised to do so. Surely she is not in danger? I proceeded to reveal everything, my own history, my first interview with Lillian, my love for her, and the reasons I had for believing it to be returned. The departure from Tennessee with the Mormon were pursued of the train and captured by the Indians in short. Everything that had occurred, up to the hour of my meeting with herself. I added my suspicions as to the sad destiny for which her sister was designed, which my own fears hindered me from concealing after giving way to those natural emotions which such a revelation was calculated to excite. The huntress maiden suddenly resumed that firmness peculiar to her character, and at once entered with me into the consideration of some plan by which Lillian might be saved from a fate which her own experience told her could be no other than infamous. Yes, cried she, giving way to a burst of anguish. Too well, knew I, the design of that perjured villain. O oh, father, lost, dishonored, O oh, sister, bartered, betrayed. Alas, poor Lillian! Nay, do not despair. There is hope yet. But we must not lose time. We must at once depart hence and continue the pursuit. True, and I shall go with you. You promised to take me to my home. Take me now where you will, anywhere that I may assist in saving my sister. Merciful heaven, she too, in the power of that monster of wickedness. Wingrove, wildly happy, at once forgiving and forgiven, was now called to our council. The faithful sure shot was also admitted to the knowledge of everything. We might stand in need of his efficient arm 
we found an opportunity of conferring apart from the Indians, for the scalping dance now engrossed their whole attention. Withdrawing some distance from the noisy ceremony, we proceeded to discuss the possibility of rescuing Lillian Holt from the grasp of that knave into whose power the innocent girl had so unprotectedly fallen. End of chapter Chapter 89 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Planning an Abduction Our deliberations occupied but a brief time. I had already considered the subject in all its bearings, and arrived at the conviction that there was only one course to be followed, by which Lillian's safety could be secured, that is, by carrying her off from the Mormon train. In this opinion her sister fully agreed. She knew it would be idle to expect that the wolf would willingly yield up his victim, and the painful thought was pressing upon her that even her own father, hoodwinked by the hypocrites that surrounded him, might reject the opportunity of saving his child. He would not be the only parent who, blinded by this abominable delusion, has similarly sacrificed upon the unhallowed altar of Mormonhood. Of this melancholy fact, Marion was not ignorant. Her unhappy journey across the Great Plains had revealed her many a strange incident, many a wicked phase of the human heart. All agreed that Lillian must be taken from the Mormons, either by force or by stealth. It must be done, too, before they could reach the Salt Lake City. Once upon the banks of the transatlantic Jordan, these pseudo-saints would be safe from the interference of their most powerful enemies. Their deed of abduction would be no longer possible, or, if still possible, too late. Was it practical elsewhere upon the route, and how was it to be effected? These were the questions that occupied us. There were but three men of us, for the Irishmen, now completely all da combo, must be left behind. True, the huntress maiden, who had declared her determination to accompany us, might well be counted as a fourth, in all four guns. But what would four guns avail against more than ten times the number? Wingrove had learnt from the wretched Chickasaw that there were a hundred men with the Mormon train. It was idle, therefore, to think of carrying her off by force. That would have been a sheer quixotism, only to end fatally for all of us. And was it not equally idle to dream of an abduction by stealth? Verily it seemed so. How were we to approach this Mormon host? How enter their camp, guarded as it would be by the jealous vigilance of lynx-eyed villains? By day it would be impossible, by night hazardous, and equally impractical would be our purpose. We could not join company with these clannish emigrants without offering some excuse. What pretext could be put forward? Had we been strangers to them, we might have availed ourselves of some plausible story, but, unfortunately, it was not so. All of us, except Sure Shot, would be known to their leader. My presence, however unexpected, would at once proclaim my purpose to the keen-witted knave, and as for Marion Halt, hers would be a position of positive danger, even equaling that in which her sister was now placed. Stebbins could claim her— if not by a true husband's right, at least by the laws of Mormon matrimony. And, of course, by those laws would the case be judged in a Mormon camp, the apostle himself being their interpreter. The hope which I had built upon the prospect of an alliance with Marion was, that by her intercession Lillian might be induced voluntarily to make her escape, even, if necessary, from her father. I had conceived the hope too hastily, without dwelling upon the danger to Marion herself. This was now evident to all of us. 
we saw that Marion could not safely enter the Mormon camp. We could not think of submitting her to a danger that might too probably conduct to a double sacrifice, two victims instead of one. Our thoughts returned upon the ex-rifleman. He was the only one of us unknown to the leader of the Mormons, and to Holt himself. To Sure Shot, then, were our hopes next transferred. He might join the train on some pretext, the rest of us remaining at a distance. By this agency, a communication might be effected with Lillian herself. The proximity of her sister made known, the perils of her own situation of which no doubt the young creature was yet entirely ignorant. Her scruples once overcome by a knowledge of her own danger, she would herself aid in contriving a plan of escape. For such a purpose, Sure Shot was the man, adroit, crafty, courageous, Thus ran our reflections. It may be wondered why, in this emergency, we had not thought of Wakara. Surely he could have given us an effective aid. With his mounted warriors, he could soon have overtaken the Mormon train, surrounded it, and dealt out the law to its leader. But we had already learnt the improbability of our appeal being acted upon. Marion had interpreted to us the views of the Utah chief in relation to the Mormons. These wily diplomats had, from their first settlement in the Utah Territory, courted the alliance of the Wakara and his band. They had made much of the warlike chief, and won his confidence and friendship, and at that hour the closest intimacy existed between him and the Mormon prophet. For this reason, Marion believed it would require a stronger motive than mere personal friendship to make him act as their enemy. In such an important enterprise, no chance should be left untried. I was determined none should be, and therefore incited Marion to make an appeal to the Utah chief. She consented. It was worth the experiment. Should the answer prove favorable, our difficulties would soon disappear, and we might hope for a speedy success. If otherwise, our prospects would still be the same, no worse. For worse they could scarcely be. Marion left us, and proceeded on her errand to the chief. We saw him withdraw from the ceremonies, and going apart engaged with the girl in what appeared an earnest and animated conversation. With hopeful hearts we looked on. Wingrove was no longer jealous. I had cured him with a hint, and the bandaged arm of his betrothed had explained the delicate attentions which the Indian had been seen to bestow upon her. The dialogue lasted for ten minutes, the speakers at intervals glancing toward us, but we knew the theme and patiently awaited the issue. It was soon to be declared to us, we saw the chief wave his hand as a signal that the conversation was ended, and the speakers parted. Wakara walked back among his warriors, while Marion was seen returning to our council. We scrutinized her countenance as she approached, endeavoring to read in it what our wishes dictated, an affirmative to our appeal. Her step was buoyant, and her glance, if not gay, at least not one that betokened disappointment. We were unable to determine, however, until her words declared the answer of the chief. As Marion had anticipated, he could not consent to act openly against the Mormons. But the tale had enlisted his sympathy, and he had even suggested a plan by which we might carry out our design without the necessity of his interference. It was this. The horseman that had just arrived chanced to be a messenger from the Mormons, Unable to find the Kuchitapa Pass, they were still encamped in the great valley of San Luis, on the banks of the Rio del Norte. The only one of them who had been across the plains before was their leader, Stebbins, of course, and he, having gone by the Cherokee Trail and Bridger's Pass, was entirely unacquainted with the route they were now following. They were in need of a guide and having encountered the Indian at this crisis, and learnt that he belonged to the band of Wakara, not far off, as the man informed them, they had dispatched him to the Utah chief, with a request that the latter would furnish them with a guide, 
and two or three of his best hunters. Before Marion had ended her explanation, I had divined the scheme. We were to personate the guide and hunters. That was the suggestion of the Utah chief. It was perfectly feasible. Nothing can be easier than the counterfeit the semblance of the American Indian. The color of the skin is of no consequence. Okra, charcoal, and vermilion made red man and white man as like as need be. And for the hair, the black tail of a horse, half covered and confined by the great plumed bonnet, with its crest dropping backwards, is a disguise not to be detected. The proud savage doffs his eagle plumes to no living man. And even the most intrusive Mormon would not dare to scrutinize too closely the coiffure of an Indian warrior. The plan was rendered further practical by a new and able ally enlisting himself into our ranks. This was the trapper, Archelite, who, from a hint given him by the Utah chief, at once volunteered to act as the guide. The Mexican had already conceived an instinctive antipathy towards the Mormon hereticos, and we might rely upon his fidelity to our cause. The scheme exactly suited the eccentric character of this singular man, and he entered upon his duties con amory, and at once. By his assistance we soon procured the required costumes and pigments, but neither were to be put on in the presence of the Utahs. It was necessary that Wakara should not be compromised by a too conspicuous intervention. The friendly chief had hinted a further promise to Marion, even an open interference in our favor. Should that become necessary, he would follow close after the Mormon train, and should our design prove a failure, might then use his influence on our behalf. This would have been the best news of all. With such a prospect, we should have had little to fear for the result, but alas, before leaving the ground, an incident occurred that threatened to prevent our generous ally from fulfilling that promise, however formally he might have made it. End of chapter Chapter 90 of The Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 90 Protector and Protege. The incident referred to was the arrival of a scout who, after the conflict, had followed upon the trail of the Arapahoes. This man brought the intelligence that the scattered enemy had again collected that, while fleeing from the route, they had met with a larger war party of their own tribe, accompanied by another of their allies, the Cheyennes, that both together formed a band of several hundred warriors, and that they were now marching back towards the valley of the Hurafano to take revenge for the death of Red Hand, and the defeat which his party had sustained. This unexpected news brought the scalp dance to an abrupt termination and changed the whole aspect of the scene. The women with loud cries rushed towards their horses with the intention of betaking themselves to a place of security, while the warriors looked to their arms, determined to make a stand against the approaching foe. It was not expected that the enemy would make their attack at once certainly not before night, and perhaps not for days. The preparations to receive them were therefore entered upon with all the coolness and deliberation that attack or defense might require. The encounter eventually came off, but it was only afterwards that I learned the result. The Utahs were again victorious. Wakara in this affair had given another proof of his strategic talent. He had made them stand by the butt, but with only half of his warriors, distributed in such a manner as to appear like the whole band. These, with their rifles, could easily defend the mound against the arrows of the enemy, and did so during an assault that lasted for several hours. Meanwhile, the other half of his band had been posted upon the bluffs, hidden among the cedars, 
and descending in the night they had stolen unexpectedly upon the allied forces and attacked them in the rear a concerted sortie from the mound had produced complete confusion in the ranks of their enemies and the utahs not only obtained a victory but hair sufficient to keep them scalp dancing for a month as i have said it was afterwards that these facts came to my knowledge i have here introduced them to show that we could no longer depend on any contingent intervention on the part of the utah chief and we were therefore the more keenly conscious that we should have to rely upon our own resources the utah showed no wish to detain us they felt confident in their own strength and in the fire weapons which they well knew how to use and after thanking the friendly chief for the great service he had rendered us and confiding our wounded comrade to his care we parted from him without further ceremony i witnessed not his parting with marian between them there was an interview but of what nature i could not tell the huntress had stayed behind and the rest having ridden forward no one of us was present at the parting scene there may have been a promise that they should meet again for that was expected by all of us but whether there was or what may have been the feelings of the indian at parting with his pale-faced protege i was not to know it was difficult to believe that the young chief could have looked so long on that face so beautifully fair without conceiving a passion for its possessor it was equally difficult to believe that if this passion existed he would have thus surrendered her to the arms of another an act so disinterested would have proved him noble indeed the rolla of the north if the passion really did exist i knew there could be no reciprocity as marion galloped up and gazed in the eyes of the handsome hunter now entirely her own her ardent glance toward the wind grove was the proud possessor of that magnificent maiden in volunteering to be one of our party marion was submitting herself to a fearful risk that of the rest of us was trifling in comparison in reality we risked nothing further than the failure of our plans and a certain punishment if taken in the act of abduction but even for this the saints would scarcely demand our lives unless in hot blood we should be slain upon the instant her position was entirely different the mormon apostle whether false husband or real could and would claim her there was no law in that land at all events no power to hinder him from acting as he should please and it was easy to foresee what would be his apostolic pleasure the very presence of wingrove would stimulate him to a revengeful course and should her indian disguise be detected marian might look forward to a fate already deemed by her worse than death she was sensible of all this but it did not turn her from her determination her tender affection for lillian her earnest desire to save her sister from the peril too plainly impending rendered her reckless about her own and the bold girl had formed the resolution to dare everything trusting to chance and her own strong will for the successful accomplishment of our purpose i no longer attempted to dissuade her against going with us how could i without her aid my own efforts might prove idle and fruitless lillian might not listen to me perhaps that secret influence on which i had so confidently calculated might exist only in a diminished degree perhaps it might be gone forever strange to say though i had drawn some sweet inferences from those neglected flowers every time the bouquet came back to my memory it produced a palpable feeling of pain he who so cunningly sued might hope for some measure of success and she so sweetly solicited more dangerous than if boldly beset had her heart withstood the sapping of such a crafty besieger my influence might indeed be gone or if a remnant of it still existed it might not turn the scale against that of her father that fearful father what should he care for one child who had already abated another to her shame possessed by these thoughts then i tried not to turn to marion for her purpose on the contrary i rather encouraged it 
on her influence with lillian i had now placed my chief reliance without that i should have been almost deprived of hope it might turn out that lillian no longer loved me time or absence might have inverted the stylus upon the tender page of her young heart and some other image may have become impressed upon its yielding tablet if so my own would sorely grieve but even if so i would not that hers should be corrupted she must not be the victim of a villain if my hand could hinder it no lillian though loved and lost i shall not add to the bitterness of your betrayal my cup of grease will possess sufficient acerbity without mingling with it the gale of revenge end of chapter chapter ninety one of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the night camp we again rode through the upper canyon of the Harafano, keeping along the bank of the stream farther on we came to the forking of two trails the more southern one leading up to the Cuchara, to the pass of the Sangrio de Cristo. By it had the gold seekers gone in company with the dragons, the later en route for the new military post of Port Massachusetts, the former, no doubt, intending to take the line of the Gala or Mojave to their still distant destination, the gold bearing placers of California. Above its upper canyon, the Hurafana bends suddenly to the north, and up its bank lies the route to Robito's Pass, the same taken by the Mormon train. We had no difficulty in following their trail. The wheel and hoof tracks had cut out a conspicuous road, and the numbers of both showed that the party was a large one, much larger than our previous information had led us to anticipate. This was of little consequence, since any case, we could not have used force in the accomplishment of our design. I regarded it rather as a favorable circumstance. The greater the multitude, the less likelihood of an individual being closely observed, or speedily missed. We reached the Rubidos Pass as the sun was sinking over the great plain of St. Louis. Within the pass we lighted upon the ground of the Mormon encampment. It had been their halting place of the night before. The wolves were prowling among the smoldering fires, whose half-burnt faggots still sent up their wreaths of filmy smoke. We now knew the history of the captured wagon and slain teamsters. Our guide had learnt it from the Utah messenger. The vehicle had belonged to the Mormons, who, at the time the Arapahoes made their attack, were only a short distance in the advance. Instead of returning to the rescue of their unfortunate comrades, their dread of the Indians had caused them to yield ready obedience to the Nepalonic motto, Sauve que pou, and they had hurried onward without making stop, till night overtook them in the Robito Pass. This version enabled me to explain what had appeared very strange conduct on the part of the escort. The character of the victims to the Arapaho attack would in some measure have accounted for the indifference of the dragoons. With the safety of the Mormons they had no concern, and would be likely enough to leave them to their fate. But the guide had ascertained that both gold diggers and dragoons, disgusted with their saintly companions de voyage, had separated from them, and having gone far ahead in all probability, knew nothing of the sanguinary scene that had enacted in the valley of the Herefano. We resolved to pass the night on the ground of the deserted encampment. By our guide's information received from the runner, the Mormons were about thirty miles in advance of us. They were encamped on the banks of the Rio del Norte. They were awaiting the answer of the Utah chief, that answer we should ourselves deliver on the following day. Having given the coyotes their kong, 
we proceeded to pitch our buffalo tents. A brace of these, borrowed from the friendly Utahs, formed part of the packing of our mules. One was intended for the use of the hunter's maiden, the other to give lodgment to the rest of our party. Not but that all of us, even Mary and herself, could have dispensed with such a shelter. We had another object in this providing ourselves. It might be necessary to travel some days in the company of the saints. In that case, the tents would serve not only for shelter, but as a place of concealment. The opaque covering of skins would protect us from the scrutinizing gaze of our fellow travelers, and in all likelihood we, the hunters of the party, should stand in need of such privacy to readjust our disguises, disarranged in the chase. Under cover of the tents we could renew our toilet without the danger of being intruded upon, chiefly for this reason, then, had we encumbered ourselves with the skin lodges. Thus far had we come without interruption, though the trail was a route frequently traveled both by Indians and whites. No one of either race had been encountered upon the way. We had seen neither man nor horse, excepting our own. For all that, we had not advanced without a certain circumsection. There was still a possibility of peril of which we were aware, and we omitted no precautions that might enable us to avoid it. The danger I allude to was a probable encounter with some of our late enemies, the Arapahoes, not those who had just been discomfited, but a party of my own pursuers of the preceding night. Some of these had returned to the butt, as already stated, but had all gone back? Might not others, stimulated by a more eager spirit of vengeance, or the ambition of striking a glorious coup by my capture, have continued the pursuit? If so, we might expect to encounter them on their return, or, if first perceived, we might fall into an ambuscade. In either case, should they chance to outnumber us, to any great extent, a collision would be inevitable and dangerous. If such a party was ahead of us, and it was still a question, we knew that they could not possibly be aware of the defeat sustained by their comrades under Red Hand, and, having no knowledge of their own predicament, would fight without that dread, with such a circumstance might otherwise have inspired. It was scarcely probable, either, that their party would be a very small one, by no means as small as our own. It was not likely that less than a dozen of their warriors would venture over ground, where, at every moment, they would risk meeting with a more powerful band of their Utah enemies. To say nothing of an encounter with a relating party from the Mormon train, weighing the probabilities that Arapahoes were ahead of us, we had taken due precaution to avoid the contingency of meeting them. We had looked for sign to contradict our suspicions or confirm them. We had not found any, either tracks of their horses or any other trace of their passage along the trail. In the canyon, yes, there we had seen the hoofprints of their horses, but not beyond it, nor at the entrance of Robito's Pass. If they had gone forward, it must have been by some parallel route, and not upon the trail of the emigrant wagons nor yet upon the area of the encampment we had been able to meet with any indications of their presence, though we had spent the last minutes of the daylight in careful scrutiny of the ground. As for myself, I looked for indications of a very different kind, but equally without success. The absence of all Lillian signs satisfied us that we had no enemy to fear. Even the wary trapper saw no imprudence of our making a fire, and one was made, a large pile, for which the half-burnt faggots scattered over the camp afforded the ready material. The fire was not called for by the cold, for the night was a mild one, but simply to serve the purposes of our cuisine, and, hungered by the long ride, we all did full justice to our supper of dried deer meat, eaten al fresco. After the meal, the men of us sat around the fire, indulging in that luxury esteemed sweet by the prairie traveler, the fumes of the nicotine weed. 
Marion had retired to her tent, and for a few minutes was lost to our sight. After a short time she came forth again, but instead of joining us by the cheerful hearth, she was seen sauntering down in the direction of the stream. This caused a direction in our party. The young backwoodsman rose to his feet, and silently, but with rather an awkward grace, walked towards the tent, not Marion's. He might as well have spared himself the trouble of taking up some of his accoutrements and pretending to examine them. The feint was perfectly transparent to the rest of us, especially when the action ended by his strolling off almost in the identical track taken by the huntress maiden. Amantes, lovers, whispered Archelite, half interrogatively, as with a smile of quite significance, he followed the receding form of the hunter. Yes, lovers who have been long separated. Corambo, do you say so? This, then, should be the rival of the false husband. I nodded assent. Poor de senor. It is not to be wondered at the canting heretico stood no chance in that game. Had it been played fairly, your comrado is a magnificent fellow. I can understand now why the wild huntress had no eyes for our mountain men here. No wonder she sighed for her far-forced home. Ah, de me, cavalero. Love is a powerful thought. Even the desert will not drive it out of one's heart. No, no, valga me Dios, no. The tone in which the Mexican repeated the last word had a tinge of sadness in it, while his eyes turned upon the fire with an expression that betrayed melancholy. It was easy to tell that he too, odd and even ludicrous, as was his personal appearance either was or had been, one of love's victims. I fancied he might have a story to tell, a love story, and at that moment my mind was attuned to listen to such a tale. Sure shot had also left us, our animals picketed a few paces off requiring his attention, and the two of us were left alone by the fire. If the trapper's tale should prove a sentimental romance, and such are not uncommon in the Mexican border land, the moment was opportune. Seeing that my new acquaintance was in the communicative mood, I essayed to draw him forth. You speak truly, I said. Love is powerful passion, and defies the desert to destroy it. You yourself have proved it so, I presume. You have souvenirs? Ah, senor, that have I, and painful ones. Painful? As poisoned? Caray! Your sweetheart has been unfaithful. No. Her parents have interfered, I suppose, as is often the case. She has been forced against her will to marry another? Ah, senor, no. She was never married. Not married? What then? She was murdered. Regret at having initiated a conversation that had stirred up such a melancholy memory hindered me from making a rejoinder and I remained silent. My silence, however, did not stay the tale. Perhaps my companion longed to unburden himself, or with some vague hope of sympathy, felt relief in having a listener. After a pause, he proceeded to narrate the story of his love and the sad incidents that led to its fatal termination. End of chapter Chapter 92 of The Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 92. Gabriela Gonzalez. Pues, senor, commenced the Mexican. Your comrades tell me you have been campaigning down below on the Rio Grande. Quite true, I have. Then you know something of our Mexican frontier life, how for the last half century we have been harassed by the Indios Bravos, our ranchos given to the flames, our grand haciendas plundered and laid waste, our very towns attacked, many of them pillaged, destroyed, and now lying in ruins. I have heard of these devastations. 
Down in Texas, I have myself been an eyewitness to a similar condition of things. Ay, true, senor. Down there, in Tejas, in Tamaulipas, things. I have heard are bad enough, good I, here in New Mexico. They are ten times worse. There they have the Comanches and Lapinos. Here we have an enemy on every side. On the east, Cayigua and Comanche. On the west, Apache and Navajo. On the south, our country is harassed by the wolf and the Mezicalero Apaches. On the north, by their kindred, the Jacarelis. While now and then, it pleases our present allies, the Utahs, to ornament their shields with the scalps of our people, and their wigwams with the fairest of our women. Carambo, senor. A happy country ours, is it not? The ironically bitter speech was intended for a reflection rather than an interrogation, and therefore needed no reply. I made none. Pues, amigo, continued the Mexican. I need hardly tell you that there is a scarce a family in the Rio del Norte, from Teos to El Paso, that has not good cause to lament this unhappy condition of things. Scarce one that has not personally suffered from the iron roads of the savages. I might speak of houses pillaged and burnt, of fields laid waste to feed the horses of the roving marauder, of sheep and cattle driven off to the desert fastness. Bah! What are all these? What signify such trifling misfortunes compared with that other calamity, which almost every family in the land may lament? The loss of one or more of its members, wife, daughter, sister, child, born off into hopeless bondage, to satisfy the will or gratify the lust of a merciless barbarian. A fearful state of affairs. Ay, senor. Even the bride has been snatched off from before the altar, from the arms of the bridegroom fondly clasping, and before he has had time to caress her. Ay de mi, cavallero. Truly can I say that. It has been my own story. Yours? Yes, mine. You ask me for souvenirs. There is one that will cling to me for life. The Mexican pointed to his mutilated limb. Carambo, continued he. That is nothing. There is another wound here in my heart. It was received at the same time, and will last equally as long, only a thousand times more painful. These words were accompanied by a gesture. The speaker placed his hand over his heart, and held it there to the end of his speech, as if to still the sad sigh that I could see swelling within his bosom, his countenance habitually cheerful almost comic in expression, had assumed an air of concentrated anguish. It was easy to divine that he had been the victim of some cruel outrage. My curiosity had become fully aroused, and I felt an eager desire to hear a tale which, though beyond doubt painful, could not be otherwise than one of romantic interest. Your lameness, then, had something to do with the story of your blighted love? You say that both misfortunes happened to you at the same time. My interrogatives were intended to arouse him from the revere into which he had fallen. I was successful, and the recital was continued. True, senor. Both came together. But you shall hear all. It is not often I speak of the affair though it is seldom out of my thoughts. I have tried to forget it. God, Ambo, how could I, with a thing like that constantly recalling it to my memory? The speaker again pointed to his deformed foot with a smile of bitter significance. Poda, Scavalero, I think of it often enough, but just now more than common, their presence— he nodded toward the lovers, whose forms were just visible in the gray twilight. The happiness, I see, reminds me of my own misery. More especially does she recall the misfortune to my memory. This wild huntress who has had misfortunes of her own. But beyond that, senor, though you may think it strange, your compasiana is wonderfully like what she was. 
Like whom? I, senor, I have not told you. She that I loved, with all the love in my heart, the beautiful Gabriela Gonzalez. Men of the Spanish race, however humble their social rank, are gifted with a certain eloquence, and in this case passion was lending poetry to the speech. No wonder I became deeply interested in the tale and longed to hear more of Gabriela Gonzalez. Envidad continued the Mexican, after a pause. There are many things in this character of your countrywoman to remind me of my lost love, even in her looks. Gabriella, like her, was beautiful. Perhaps your comrade yonder might not think her so beautiful as the huntress. But that is natural. In my mind, Gabriella was everything. She had Indian blood in her veins. We all have in these parts— though we boast of our pure Spanish descent. No matter, Gabriella was white enough. To my eyes, white as the lily that sparkles upon the surface of the lagoon. Like yonder maiden, she inherited from her ancestors a free, daring spirit. She feared neither our Indian enemies nor danger of any kind. Poor Dios, not she. Of course she loved you? Ah, that truly did she. Else why should she have consented to marry me? What was I? A poor caballero, at times a hunter and trapper of beavers, just as I am now. I was possessed of nothing but my horse and traps, while as he, Garambo, senor, proud regals, pretended to her hand. It is possible— that my countenance may have expressed incredulity. It was difficult to conceive how the diminutive Mexican, as he appeared just then in my eyes, could have won the love of such a grand belle, as he was describing Gabriella to be. Still was he not altogether unhandsome, in earlier life, before his great misfortune had befallen him? He might have been gifted with some personal graces, high qualities I had heard of his possessing. Among others, courage beyond question or suspicion, and in those frontier regions, accursed by the continual encroachment of Indian warfare, and where human life is every day in danger, that is a quality of the first class, esteemed by all. But by none more than those who stand most in need of protection, the women, Often there is elsewhere, more often than elsewhere, does courage take precedence of mere personal appearance, and boldness wins the smile of beauty. It was possible that possession of this quality on the part of Pedro Archilite had influenced the heart of the fair Gabriella. This might explain her preference. The Mexican must have partially divined my thoughts, as was proved by the speech that followed. Yes, amigo. More than one rich haciendo would have been only too happy to have married Gabriella, and yet she consented to become my wife, though I was just as I am now, maybe a little better looking at this time, though I can't say that I ever passed for an Apollo. No, no, senor. It was not my good looks that won the heart of the girl. Your good qualities? Not much to boast of, Cavallero. True in my youth, I had the name of being the best horseman in our village, the best rastrero, the most skillful trapper. I could tail the bull, run the cock, and pick up a girl's ribbon at full gallop, perhaps a little more adroitly than my competitors. But I think it was something else that first gained me the young girl's esteem. I had the good fortune once to save her life, when, by her own imprudence, she had gone out too far from the village and was attacked by a grizzly bear. Ay, de me, it mattered not. Poor Nina, she might as well have perished then, by the monster's claws. She met her death from worse monsters, a death far more horrible, but you shall hear. Go on, from what you have disclosed, I am painfully interested in your tale. End of chapter
Chapter ninety three of The Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed. Chapter ninety three A Bloody Bridal. Pues, senor, what I am about to tell you happened full ten years ago, though it's as fresh in my mind as if it was yesterday. You may have heard of the village of Valverde. It is about fifty leagues south of Santa Fe, on the Rio del Norte, that portion of the valley we call the Rio Abajo. It was at one time a settlement of some importance, rich and prospering as any in New Mexico, but, in consequence of the incursions of the Apaches, it fell into decay is now a complete ruin without a single inhabitant well amigo it was there i was born and there lived i till i was twenty-five years of age up to the time when that calamity befell me and mine the same i am about to speak of i may say two years after that time for i did not leave the neighbourhood till i had taken revenge upon those who were the cause of my misfortunes i have spoken of gabriella gonzales i have told you that i loved her but i could not find words to tell you how much i loved her you who have come all this way in pursuit of a sweetheart you caballero can understand all that like you with yours i too could have followed gabriella to the end of the world pues amigo like you i had the good fortune to be loved in return i could not divine the object of the mexican in proclaiming this similitude perhaps it was done with the view of cheering me for the quick-witted fellow had not failed to notice my despondency it could only be a conjecture on his part for how could he know aught of lillian beyond the fact of my preference for her and that she was the object of our expedition of course he was aware like all the others of the purpose of our pursuit from sure shot or wingrove he might have learned a little more but neither he nor they could possibly have been acquainted with a sentiment of which alas i was myself in doubt the very doubt which was producing my despondency his incidental allusion could have only been conjecture i would have joyed to believe it just but whether just or not it had the effect of soothing me and silently accepting it i permitted him to continue his narration i need not enter into the particulars of my wooing gabriella lived upon an acto some distance below balberde and nearer to the desert of the dead man's journey jornada del muerto of which no doubt you have heard mention her father was a atero and owned large flocks of sheep he pastured them upon the great plains on the eastern side of the sierra blanca where i was in the habit of going in my capacity of cibolero to hunt the buffaloes the hatero and i became acquainted became friends he invited me to visit his house and i went i saw gabriella for the first time and ever afterwards was her beautiful face before my eyes i went often as you may believe caballero but for a long time i was uncertain whether i was welcome i mean to gabriella for her father still continued my friend it was only after the incident i have mentioned my saving her from the bear that i felt certain my love was returned she had ventured too far into the mountains where i had chanced to be at the time i heard her voice calling for help i ran through the rocks and came up just as a huge bear was springing upon her i was a good shot and my bullet brought down the monster stretching him lifeless at her feet gabriella thanked me with sweet words with smiles that were far sweeter and told me still more from that hour i knew that she was mine shortly after she consented to marry me you were married then married but only for an hour only for an hour ah senor just so one hour of wedded life and then we were parted for ever death parted us death to her to me worse than death despair that has never left me no never will 
the voice of the speaker trembled in sorrowful tone it was manifestly a sorrow that defied any efforts i might have made at consolation i made none but in silence and with eager attention awaited to hear the denouement of a drama whose prologue promised such a tragical ending pues senor proceeded the narrator after a short silence gabriella as i have said consented to marry me and we were married it was the day of our wedding we had parted from the church and with our friends had gone out into the country for a dia de campo there were about twenty of us in all young men and girls about an equal number of each all in their holiday dresses just as they had been to the church most of the girls were gabriella's bridesmaids and still wore the flowers and jewels they had used at the ceremony the place chosen for our dia de campo was a pretty spot about a mile distant from the town it was a glade in the midst of the chaparral surrounded by beautiful trees and sweet-smelling flowers we went afoot for the distance did not make it worth while for us to ride besides we preferred enjoying the ramble without being encumbered with horses well senor we had arrived on the ground spread out the repast we had brought with us uncorked the wine bottles and were in the full tide of enjoyment talking and laughing gaily when all of a sudden we heard the trampling of horses not of one or two but the hoof strokes of a whole troop at first we thought it might be the caballada of some rich proprietor galloping past the place we knew that horses were pastured in that neighbourhood and it was like enough to be one of the half-wild droves straying through the chaparral still we were not without apprehension for it might also be a troop of apaches who in those times made frequent forays upon the defenceless settlements alas caballero our apprehensions proved but too just we had been seated on the grass around our festive preparations we had scarce time to spring to our feet ere the yell of the savages sounded in our ears and almost on the instant the glade was filled with dusky warriors they were all upon horseback brandishing their long lances and winding their lassos around their heads fearfully painted and whooping their wild cries they resembled the very demonias we could neither retreat nor defend ourselves against such odds it would have been idle to have attempted the latter besides we were all without weapons on an occasion like that which had called us forth one does not think of preparing for such an event i own it was impudent of us to go out unarmed more especially when the country was filled with indian novedades but who could have dreamt that such was to be the fatal termination to our joyous dia de campo ah de me i may well call it fatal very few of our men survived that dreadful day two or three of the young fellows managed to retreat into the bushes and afterwards got off the others were killed upon the spot most of them impaled upon the spears of the apaches the women were left untouched for the indians rarely kill our women them they reserve for a different destiny ah caballero a destiny worse than death not one of them escaped the poor ninas were all made captives and each borne off in the arms of a swarthy savage was mounted upon his horse gabriella the queen of all because by far the most beautiful was chosen by the chief i saw her struggling in his grasp i saw him dragging her over the ground and raising her to the withers of his steed i saw him leap up behind her and prepare to ride off gabriella my beloved my bride here the speaker paused as if overcome by the very remembrance of the incidents he was relating and it was some time before he became sufficiently composed to resume his narrative end of chapter ninety three chapter ninety four of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter ninety four a rough drag recovering himself at length the narrator proceeded you may ask senor how i came to be witness of all these outrages was i not speared like my companions was i not like them killed upon the spot i answer no i was still alive and i might almost say uninjured true i had been beaten and bruised in the struggle for i had made an impotent effort at defending myself but they had not killed me i was for a time stunned and senseless but my senses returned before the fray was over and i was a witness to the closing scene it was then i saw the young girls in the act of being hurried off by their captors it was then my heart was wrung by the spectacle of gabriella struggling in the arms of the chief i was helpless to interfere i was prostrate upon the earth and held fast in the gripe of two brawny savages one kneeling on each side of me i expected them at every instant to put an end to my life i awaited the final blow either the stroke of a tomahawk or the thrust of a spear i only wondered they were delaying my death my wonder ceased when i at length got my eyes on the face of the apache chief which up to that moment i had not seen then i recognized an old enemy whom i had encountered on the plains and i saw that the recognition was mutual this explained why they had not finished me on the spot i was spared only to suffer some more horrible mode of death it was not long till i was made acquainted with their intention i saw the chief telegraph some order to the indians who guarded me which one of the latter hastened to execute a lazo was looped around my ankle and carried out the other end of it was made fast to the tail of a horse after which the indian leaped upon the back of the animal the other also mounted his own horse and this whole troop appeared ready to gallop off i could see that the savages were hastening their departure there was but a small band of them and as the place was near a large town they had reason to fear pursuit those of our party who had escaped would return at once to the town where troops were stationed at the time this explained to me the hurried movements the indians were making caramba senor i had not much opportunity to reflect on the chances of our being rescued by our friends i saw what the savages intended for me and that was sufficient to occupy all my thoughts i was to be dragged at the tail of a horse yes cavallero and the infernal design was instantly carried into execution for in a moment after the chief gave the signal to ride forward and the whole troop went off at a gallop he to whose croup i was attached was last in the line and consequently i was trailed along without coming in contact with the others the long lazo separating me from his horse by a distance of more than a dozen yards fortunately the ground over which they dragged me was free from rocks and other inequalities else i should have been torn to pieces it chanced to be a smooth grassy sward and protected by my leathern jaqueta and calzoneros i was less injured than one might expect it was my ankle that suffered most for the loop soon slipped down below the joint and nearly drew the bone out of its socket that senor is how i came to be uncoho as you see with a bitter smile the speaker pointed to his deformed foot and then continued well i suppose it would have killed me in the end 
since the smooth turf did not extend far in the direction the savages were taking but just then an idea came into my head that gave me some hope of being able to relieve myself from my perilous situation after the first hundred yards or so had been passed over i saw that the savages had ceased to pay any attention to me they were all too eager to hurry onward besides they were occupied with the women captives it occurred to me that if i could only get my foot free from the noose i might part company with my captors without any of them perceiving it i remembered that i had a knife in my pocket and as my hands had been left free i believed that i could get my fingers upon it notwithstanding the rapid rate at which i was being jerked over the ground i tried to get out my knife and succeeded as good luck would have it just then the path on which my captors were travelling narrowed between two groves of timber forming a kind of avenue or lane through this the troop had to pass in indian file my particular horsemen still keeping in the rear while going through the gallop of the horses was interrupted or at least their pace was greatly slackened the rearmost of the band being thrown almost into a walk this gave me the opportunity i desired and making an effort i doubled my body over on itself until i was able to reach the lazo beyond my foot a single cut of my keen blade severed the thong and i was detached on the instant with anxious gaze i looked after the retreating horsemen fearing that they would see what i had done gallop back and spear me where i lay but to my great joy i saw them ride on till the last of them was out of sight yes cavallero continued the narrator i saw the last horse and the very tail to which i had been attached pass out of sight no doubt the horse knew what had happened but not his rider not one of the whole troop appeared to have any suspicion that there was aught amiss until i had crawled into the bushes and got some distance from the path then i could hear them as they galloped back and rode whooping through the thicket in search of me caramba senor i then felt more anxious than ever up to that time i had no thought of anything else than being rubbed out i had been certain of it from the first moment of the attack upon our party now however i had conceived a hope that i might escape and return to the rescue of gabriella to be captured the second time would have been ten times more disagreeable than at first when there was no opportunity either to hope for safety or to reflect on the means of securing it now that a chance of life had offered itself i was doubly fearful of losing it i could make but little headway so much was i disabled but half hobbling half crawling i worked on through the thicket in the direction of the town i could hear the savages beating the bushes behind and every moment i expected to have them upon me they would in time have traced and overtaken me but perhaps they cared not much for the capture they had secured the booty they most prized and probably reflected that by wasting time in searching for me they might risk losing it again for this or some other reason they gave up the search and i could tell by their voices heard at a greater distance that they were riding off without staying to assure myself i limped on to the town which i reached at length two of my friends who had escaped at the first onslaught had got there before me the news of the sad disaster had spread like a 
prairie fire the whole population was excited by the outrage but the young girls made captives had many friends and relations in the place so also the men who had been murdered the troops were summoned to arms it chanced to be a squadron of lancers one of the best then in the service of the government and these along with a hundred volunteers all mounted rode forth in pursuit of the savages notwithstanding that my wounded ankle pained me exceedingly i was able to accompany them on horseback americano i fear my narrative may be wearying you therefore i shall not enter into the particulars of the pursuit sufficient to say that we succeeded in overtaking the ravishers it was near midnight when we came up with them we found them in their camp with huge fires blazing all over the ground we approached within pistol range before any alarm was given they had been carousing on mescal and were keeping no guard the bright blaze showed us how they had been occupied the women sat here and there many of them lying prostrate upon the earth their torn garments and dishevelled air betokened that a sad catastrophe had befallen them we could bear the sight no longer with hearts full of vengeance both soldiers and citizens rushed upon the base despoilers and the work of retribution began gabriella had been the first to become aware of our advance and springing to her feet had bounded beyond the reach of her captors and was running outward to meet us i de me it was the last race of her life an indian arrow shot after was too quick for her and pierced through and through she fell dying into my arms oh brisita she kissed me with her parting breath and then expired ah senor that was a kiss of death a long deep drawn sigh and the drooping attitude into which the speaker had fallen told me that he had ended his narrative out of respect to the sacredness of his sorrow i forbore questioning him farther at the time it was only afterwards that i learned from him some of the additional particulars how most of the savages were slain upon the spot and the captive girls rescued but although escaping with lifer they had all been victims of barbarian lust that brought more than one of them to an early grave a wild tale it may appear and although we may term it a romance of new mexico its counterpart is not the less an oft-recurring reality in that unhappy land end of chapter ninety four recording by john brandon chapter ninety five of the wild hundreds this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter ninety five assuming the disguise our fire began to burn low before the lovers returned into its light during their moonlit ramble no doubt many sweet memories were renewed no wonder they should wish to prolong it but all of us required a certain measure of rest and it was time to make the necessary arrangements for passing the night although we had given up all apprehension on the score of the arapahoes yet there was no reason why we should not observe a proper prudence and keep prepared for any emergency that might arise in that wild neutral road trodden by many tribes an enemy may spring up at any moment or come from any side it was agreed between us 
that one should keep watch while the others slept each taking his tour of guard throughout the night marion of course accepted from this detail and after bidding us all good night the huntress maiden retired to her tent at the entrance of which the ever faithful and ever watchful wolf placed himself there did the great dog stretch his body a sentinel couchant with such grim cerberus like resolution that even wingrove might not have dared to cross the threshold of that sacred precinct as yet we had not assumed our indian disguises the opening scene of the travesty was reserved for the morning and after arranging the hours of our respective watches the trapper taking the first and longest the rest of us crept under the covering of the buffalo lodge and sought the repose necessary to recruit us for coming events at earliest dawn and long before the sun had gilded the snowy summits of the spanish peaks we were all afoot a breakfast similar in materials to our supper of the preceding night was hastily prepared and still more hastily eaten after that we proceeded to equip ourselves for the masquerade pegleg acted as principal costumer and well understood he the role he was called upon to perform perfectly acquainted with the utah costume both that used for war and the chase there was no fear about the correctness of his heraldry being called in question he knew every quartering of the utah escutcheon with a minuteness of detail that would have done credit to a king at arms for himself he needed no disguise as a trapper of taos he might also be an associate of utah hunters and personally unknown to the mormons they would have no other thoughts about him further than that their friend wakara had sent him to guide them across the deserts of the colorado at the mormon camp therefore he could present himself in his mexican costume without the saints having the slightest suspicion as to his true character this left him free to lend his services to the rest of us and assist in our heraldic emblazonment his first essay was upon myself my features being sufficiently pronounced rendered it all the more easy to make an indian of me and a uniform coat of vermilion over my neck face and hands transformed me into a somewhat formidable-looking warrior a buckskin hunting tunic leggings and moccasins concealed the remainder of my skin while some locks of long hair extracted from the mane and tail of my arab and craftily united to my own dark tresses with the plumed bonnet and drooping crest over all completed a costume that would have done me credit at a parisian ball mosque with equal facility was accomplished the metamorphosis of the young backwoodsman but not so easily that of shoreshot the nez retroussé thin yellow hair and green gray eyes appeared to be insurmountable obstacles to the indianizing of the ex-rifleman pegleg however proved an artist of skill the chevelure of shoreshot well saturated with charcoal paste assumed a different hue a black circle around each eye neutralized the tint of both iris and pupil to his face was given a ground coat of red ochre while some half dozen dark stripes painted longitudinally over it and running parallel to the nose extinguished the snub transforming the yankee into as good an indian as any upon the ground marion was her own dresser and while we were engaged outside was making her toilet within the tent her costume would require but little alteration it was indian already her face alone needed masking and how was that to be done to speak the truth i was apprehensive upon the score of her disguise i could not help reflecting on the fearful fate 
that awaited her should the counterfeit be detected and the girl identified all along i had felt uneasy upon this point and had been endeavouring to devise some scheme by which to avoid the imprudence of her presenting herself in the mormon camp but the thought of lillian the perilous situation in which she was placed perhaps more than all the selfishness of my own love had hindered me from thinking of any definite alternative when i saw the huntress maiden issue forth from her tent her face empurpled with the juice of the allegria berries her cheeks exhibiting each a circle of red spots with a line of similar markings extended across her forehead i no longer felt apprehension for the result though the hideous tattooing could not hide the charms of her speaking countenance it had so changed its expression that even wingrove himself would not have recognized her more like was it to baffle the scrutiny of father and false husband in due time we were all dressed for the drama and after making a cache of our cast-off garments we struck tents and moved forward to the performance the faithful wolf accompanied us it was against my wish and contrary to the counsel of our guide but marian would not part with a companion that more than once had protected her from cruel enemies the dog had been disguised as the rest of us shorn of his shaggy coat with his tail trimmed smooth as that of a greyhound his skin moreover stained indian fashion there seemed but slight danger that the animal could be recognized. End of chapter ninety five. Recording by John Brandon.